Hi, I'm Sam Neill, and I want you to meet my duck, Magda. I named her after my friend and one of my favorite actors, comedians, and writers, Magda Shabansky, whose ability to entertain is only surpassed by her willingness to think deeply about and talk out about complex issues. And as you'll see in this Australian story special, she's teamed up with the most unlikeliest of buddies in her never ending quest to make the world a better place. We're leaving in half an hour, just waiting for Magda, and we're all really excited. Hey! We have to do the remote. I know, I want to give you a hug, but we can't. Mm. I, oh, 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 that's it. No, this sorry. is my new thing. It's my yeah. reverencing. Right. Yeah. William and our family will travel to New South Wales and spend some time where the bushfires um, happened last year and see the impacts of that. Magda will be with us in another car. OK, turning on the glory of pride. How low can you go This was the very first time we were going to Tumbarumba and Batlo. And as much as anything, it's a recce, you know, to find out what the community wants. Hello. Honestly, Magda and I have no idea what to expect once we're going up to the Snowy Valley area. Sorry, Magda, good to see you. We're a bit nervous that we're going to be intruding or with the timing isn't right to go and visit. You got to move. But just being around people and just making them laugh feels like it's so, like, therapeutic. Nothing went the way I thought it would. Can we do it one more time? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can we do it one more time? Yeah. The practice run. But of course not, you know, because you can't plan that sort of stuff. Oh! Yeah, I can Wait. Doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. Well, suddenly I realised <laughs> that I was in this sort of financial legal venture with a 19-year-old boy who I really knew nothing about and his mum. <laughs> it was not what I expected to be involved with Egg Boy. <laughs> OK, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest in Tumbarama. Give her a big Tumbarama warm welcome. Thank you. Here she comes. I had a quick dip earlier, in, and so I'm feeling refreshed. Would you like some Irish dancing? Yeah. OK, unfortunately, as I was getting out of the creek, I have done my knee. So um, I can only do Irish dancing from the waist up. And this is what Irish dancing from the waist up looks like. <laughs> Thank you. Magda is a force for change and a force for decency and just such a really complex Australian national treasure. I'm not going to pretend that I've been through anything like what you've been through. All we can do is let you know that those of us in the city have not forgotten. Magda's particular interest was about trauma, was about recovery from trauma and coming back from that. We're all a bit bent and broken from the fires, and we all have good days and bad days. I think the people of Tumbarumba would embrace whatever she wanted to help us with, uh, and we all need help, even though a lot of us say that we don't. We have the best, the best um, mental health PTSD experts in this country, like world's best. And by God, we're going to do our best to get that out to rural Australia. Like when you're in a township, it's like, it doesn't feel quite so real, but here it's just like... It surprised me that somehow or another Magda and Egg Boy had got together to raise money for traumatised communities. You can feel that something happened here. It's obvious to see, but you can feel it. Yeah. But it's a good connection. Here you've got a young man who's clearly committed to taking a stand and a significant Australian cultural figure coming together for a shared cause across generations. I'm very proud of Will. No, thank you. <laughs> proud of you too. No. <laughs> I'm a really reluctant activist. I don't like confrontation, but I do get my back up. 
and it's a protective thing, you know, for, for young people like Will. Like, what world are we giving them? What do we want? Why? Tens of thousands of students have joined rallies across the country demanding that Canberra listens to future voters. I was in Year 12 and uh, there was a climate change rally. I never really voiced my opinion on anything. I'd never really gone out and done something. And, you know, it was pretty inspiring. And I was, there was a lot of, like, emotion there. And then on the way home, I saw the video of the Christchurch shooting. At least 40 people have been killed in terrorist attacks on two mosques. And it was just two emotional cocktails collide, like, oh, the gut sank. And then an hour later, the senator released his statement about that shooting. Fraser Anning took it upon himself to use that as an opportunity to push an agenda about immigration of Muslims essentially saying, although these particular Muslims aren't responsible for extreme acts of terrorism across the globe, that doesn't mean that they are blameless. ISIS is finished. It's safe for them to go home there. They can go and help rebuild the country. Will was really taken aback by everything that was going on. How can this happen in the world? That night, William read on Facebook that Fraser Anning would be speaking around the corner from our house. It's a five minute bike ride. I didn't know this at the time. The next day I said to Will, I'm gonna have a lie down. Don't wake me up for anything. So I've gone into this event and then I looked around and I saw families who were bringing their kids to listen to this man. The refugee problem is costing us both ways. And I saw this is just weird and wrong, and people were clapping him. I'm getting a lot of criticism now. I don't know why over what happened in uh, uh, New Zealand yesterday. And then he started saying things like, there were already seven Muslims in parliament, and Sudanese people, they need to go back to where they came from. The civil war is pretty much over, so it's a safe place to go back to, so it's time to go back. Something clicked inside of me. So I've walked up. In 10 seconds, I've got up behind the senator and then I've cracked the egg. And then got tackled to the ground by five men. Very quickly, a viral video started to appear in people's feeds of a young boy that wasn't having any of it. I woke up turn my phone on to a message on Facebook. Get the cops! Do what you told him, mate! Get the cops! Huh? Huh? Words can't even describe the terror, disbelief. It's nothing but a weak voice. human being. You freak. Not even today can I watch that footage, even though it's been plastered all over the world. The act of defiance that captured the world's attention. Egg boy. Boy. The fundraising page has already been set up to collect donations to cover the teenagers' legal fees and to quote, buy more eggs. More eggs! Many people didn't agree with what he did. Just because you didn't like what the senator said? Well, that completely justifies him being physically assaulted. What's wrong with you, huh? A lot of people loved it. He is donating money raised in his name to the victims of the New Zealand massacre. Egg boy, you're already a national hero. What more could you do right? I was like, good on you. Oh, I totally understood why Will did that. It was like a scream of rage. He was just incensed and, and, and I got that. All of a sudden, he has this huge social media following. He is being approached by talent agents and offered a lot of money to endorse products. Big name bands say he can have free concert tickets for life. He's been offered a Turkish holiday, a lifetime of dreams. People were trying to leverage off me all the time and I started to feel like an object. William struggled with people liking um, Egg Boy because that's not Will. You know, Egg Boy's Egg Boy, Egg Boy's a meme. And Will said everyone always comes up and says, oh, Will, you're a legend. And but they, he would say to me, Mum, they don't know me. It's not me. It's Egg Boy. It went from stroking the ego to just insecurity and anxiousness. And 
Now, I don't like life as much. What the hell? The only thing left to do then was to give back. And that's when the healing really started to happen. I got a phone call from a friend who said, hey, can you have a word with him? So I rang up and I said, well, I'm going to this conference with 300 amazing, innovative minds that want to make you know, a better Australia. How about you come up there and you ask for guidance? As we talk about being comfortable with being uncomfortable, you'll learn a little bit more about Will. And then Will spoke and I was really struck by him. And then I saw Queensland Senator and I thought, how could someone in a position of authority spread that hate speech? I just thought, I hope he's okay, you know, because they'll, they'll, you know, fame is a really, ooh, it's a tricky, it, it can be a monster. And after I've done this speech with Jules, Magda prods me on the shoulder and she was like, you're gonna come with me, like, we're gonna be friends or whatever. And I was just like, oh, okay, thanks. I don't really know who you are. <laughs> like, I didn't know who she was. And everyone's like looking around like, oh, he doesn't know who Magda is. What is he doing? And then we didn't see one another um, between then and when the fires happened. By eight in the morning, the temperature had peaked at 49 degrees, with winds gusting up to 80 kilometres an hour. The fires of 2019, 2020 were cataclysmic. What the people went through in Batlow, Tumut and Tumbarumba was horrific. We had stock behind us trying to get them into the safe areas. And that's one thing that really sticks in my heart. It's like a colonel leaving his troops. We had to walk away and leave them. As we were evacuating, we could literally see the fire come over the back of our place. We could see it just swallow our farm. It felt like the harbinger of, oh my God, this really could be what the future's going to be like. I, I was ringing anyone I could get in contact with in state government um, and, and federal government, you know, saying if there's anything I can do to help. And then Will messaged me and said, Hi Magda, do you want to collaborate? We can help out with the bushfires. Maybe raise some money or you never know, like, do you have an idea, could we do something? And she was like, yeah, look, come around to my house tomorrow. And mum was like, oh my God, do you know whose house we're going to? And I was like, yeah, we're just gonna help out for the bushfires, like, it's all right, mum. <laughs> so is that okay if I call you Kimmy? Oh, no, Kimberly. <laughs> look, Kimberly. At look at me, look at me. So then it was like, okay, what do we want to do? And everyone was very focused on the immediate needs. So there was no point us giving more money for that. People won't just be feeling traumatised now. It's actually a year and 18 months later, and even further on than that. I really didn't have to think about it too long, that it should be about long-term trauma, mental health help and support. OK, so start a GoFundMe. We'll put my name to it more because of my computer, I suppose, yeah? I don't know, I can just sense it with Magda that there is some angst. But Apparently. I'm the older don't, adult. Don't click next. <laughs> don't click next. Oh. And there's angst in everyone, right? but I sense a lot more angst than a normal person. I am way more shy than people think. I can so introvert to the point that I might never out-travert again. Like, I, I, when I go in and I just can just not leave the house for long periods of time. I grew up around people who had experienced genuine hell on earth and they either were in denial about it or nervous wrecks or drank themselves to death. And I think my whole life I've sort of been a bit obsessed with the idea of what do you do when the worst thing that you can imagine happens and that your world as you know it ceases to exist? How do you find your way through that? Magda was always close to her family. Happy birthday, love. Hey. Happy birthday, love. Oh, thank you, my darling. <laughs> Even though he was chatty and charismatic and witty, 
There was always a terrifically reserved quality about Magda's father. So in a way, I was not surprised that there was another side to Mr. Zhbansky. Do you retangled him? My father had just turned 15 and the Nazis invaded Poland, which precipitated the Second World War. Can you remember hearing the first bomb? Oh, God, of course. What was that like? That must have been terrifying. A bit terrifying. <laughs> I was 36 when I filmed him. And when I watch myself, I can see I'm sort of, you know, the shortness of breath because, honestly, I didn't know what was going to come out. Me and father stood in the archway, but we stood there when they were bombing. There was a person was blown to bits just outside. And then, and then I put the tapes on my, on my bookshelf, and I just honestly I couldn't watch them for ages. It was just too painful. I just couldn't go there. People don't realize what it was, you know, instantaneous death on the spot. Sorry, I just get a bit upset actually. You know. It's also because Dad's dead. <laughs> this is Andrew. Mm hmm Yeah. This is me. Yeah. When my father was 19, he was recruited by his brother-in-law, Anjay, into Unit 993W, which was directly answerable to the head of the entire Polish underground. And they were given the job of executing people who had collaborated with the Germans. Hibner was known as Nina. Because that was yeah, her pseudonym. That she was known in the same as I was known as Clive. The way my father would describe himself was as an assassin. And that's because the work that he was doing wasn't in the heat of battle. I said, why did you join that unit? And he said, I couldn't stand what was happening to the Jews. The uprising was heroic yet futile. An army of teenage volunteers against two SS divisions. The Warsaw Uprising started and my father was involved in some of the heaviest fighting. The stories are horrendous. Once they knew they were defeated, they had to escape and my father never saw his parents again. So the price that he paid was he lost everything. My father sort of coped with it by just stoically shutting it off. I mean, that same capacity that he had to be an assassin, he had to shut down everything that wasn't central to survival. Record, record, record. Says Rick. He oh, said God, to me God. that he was always terrified that one of his kids would be a traitor. We and I was always like, that is a freaking weird thing to say. What does that mean? <laughs> and basically, it meant that there was some small part of him that was still Warsaw, that was still like he would, he, he would have to kill someone who was a traitor, even if that was his own kids. Good. People form these thoughts and these worldviews in these terribly traumatic situations. And then they have to get on with life, and often they don't examine them. But it's there, and certainly as a second generation, you pick up on it. You know, I was measuring myself constantly. So we're going, well, how would I behave in a concentration camp? Would I be the fat, greedy one who would take all the... You know, all of that, and, and examining and being very, very hard on myself about any weakness, um, you know, feeling... And, and basically, it's that mindset of always having my father looking at me as how would I behave in this situation. When we were in second year university, Magda threw herself into politics, into feminist politics, uh, being involved in the women's room, working at a refuge. And I used to have these raging arguments with my father, you know. I wanted to change the world. I thought you could change the world. And he could see that I was a sucker for a cause. He could see that I had that same impulse that he had, and he was worried for me because he knew the price of that. And then I, I travelled to Poland. Oh, what a heart palpitation just thinking about it. Behind there, they are the urns. 
of people who actually died in the concentration camp. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. I was very, very cut off from my emotions in a lot of ways. I mean, I pretty much what I would describe, well, not pretty much, actually. It was completely a nervous breakdown. It was hardly surprising that when I came back, all I wanted to do was comedy. <laughs> well, wouldn't you? <laughs> the only sane response, I think. And if you think that I can be silent for one second, then you haven't been listening to a word. I'm doing a nude film. Hurry up. Just call me Mike from the Tactical yeah. Response Group. <laughs> so, do you want me to get my hair done or not? There's an energy in comedy that I believe is pure life force and pure joy. Yes, thanks, Peter. Yes, Peter. It was also undeniably a way to avoid anything dark or real. Zeppelin cam camera work there. I needed to do that for about 30 years. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I felt like I could get back into the fray. If we can learn to get the measure of first, second, third generation trauma, if we can learn how to alleviate that suffering, how to help others who are going through that suffering, I'm all in. I am like, I'm in all in. I will do whatever I can to help. All together, we raised $181,000. And we thought, now we've got all this money, what the hell do we do with it? <laughs> we didn't know what to do. I was already following Magda and Will on Instagram. And I remember thinking at the time, oh my God, you know, these two people that I really admire, wouldn't it be wonderful if they actually gave some of that money to do creative art programs? We've now had 11, 11 month long projects, two projects a year, with ADF personnel who have been wounded, injured or ill as a part of their service, uh, which has been fantastic. Actually, that's something that they bring out a lot, isn't it, the humour? Such, yeah. such great humour. Yeah. yeah. Time and again, we see military people bloom and develop some sense of hope. To be honest, an art-based program would not have been the first thing that I would have gone towards because it, it doesn't seem, it seems too light and fluffy, you know? We know in people with post-traumatic stress, that the area of the brain, which is to do with symbolic expression, in an MRI looks almost dead. Yes, this is backed up by science. And it was only in conversations with Ian and Jordan that they educated me about the fact that there's a scientific basis for the way in which art changes the brain. It regenerates neural pathways that have been broken by trauma. You know, it links in with the clinical practice. And out of that regeneration group. Post regeneration, eh? Hold on, guys. Regeneration. It's sort of like a really stark, eerie beauty, isn't it? The black trunks with the green growing out. It's got such a relief when you see the green. We're going back to the Snowy Valley so that we can get a real sense from the locals as to what they've been through and what they need. Was there a wind shear that, or it just was? Yeah. Yeah. Just creating its own storm, so. What we're doing is finding out how to translate what has worked for years with the military to a civilian community. They know, they know that it can really help people in terms of healing. We're still getting to know who are the people who are worst affected, what are the services that are already on the ground. We're dealing with different challenges now. The work that you guys do is incredible and needed, but as long as we're getting the right stuff in at the right time, you know. We can't just parachute in as though we know everything. We've got to be there, we've got to listen, and that takes time. I'm watching Magda communicate with all these people and what is apparent is how wise and wisely soft she like approaches them. You've been using your brain in a different way, isn't it, you know? Try something. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I'm kind of like this adolescent, just blah, yeah. Really, really grateful to be able to help you guys and, and uh, yeah, it's just awesome, you know? It's a gorgeous relationship that Will and Magda have. Let's put that out there. And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Obviously completely different, but Magda has the wisdom that William doesn't have. Somebody in the town said, oh, you got to meet Macca. He's, he's, he's a whacker. G'day, Macca. Hello, beautiful. 
and they said, oh, he's a, an old cocky and, uh, and he's got a great sense of humour. We just turned the water off for you. <laughs> but then they said, and I just, oh, my heart broke, you know. They said that he's, like, having nightmares and really upset about his cattle and about his cattle burning. My eldest son and myself ended up getting the cattle to there. And the firestorm come down over us, just turned black. Uh, grass and birds and everything was just... And we fought tooth and nail to save. I get emotional. After the fires, uh, I went to a dark place, you know. I thought, where do you start? What do you do? Do you walk away? Do you know the stuff we're going to do with the arts programs? Do you reckon we can get old cockies, blokes like you, involved in something like that? Do you reckon there's any chance? What's your feeling? Probably, you'll probably get 70 70 percent, maybe. Yeah. Really? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because. Uh, Do you want to help us, or I don't want to put pressure yeah, on you? No, We'd no. Like I them. know there's there's people out there hurting. I didn't know how to approach it, so Magda sort of took the lead, and and he knew who she was, and I think she actually brought him some healing, and 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 uh, and it was really good to see those two really um, come together. These are the the generation we've got to look after. You know, yeah. I'm through. I'm a, I'm through the I'm through you. the gate. I'm in here. Yeah, but, you know, we've got to leave the country in a workable situation so you people can carry on. OK, love you all. As well as people like Macca and the older folk who are affected, we really want to get through to the younger people, and that's where Will is just precious. You know, he's invaluable because he has that relatability for them. At the high school that I go to, we got footy people in. They came in, they did demonstrations, they talked about how much we've been through, and then they left. Come on, get going, I want to see it. I want to see some silly. Come on. When Will and Magda came, it felt like they actually were going to do something like to help the community and our school. Basically, we're bringing some of the best trauma experts in the world to Tumbarumba and Tumut and Batlow. And what we're going to do is use the arts as a way to help you open up, engage, express yourselves. You might have been feeling like you've been forgotten. We definitely haven't forgotten, and I wanted to make that clear. A lot of young people really connect strongly with Will because they get that sense of desperation, you know. They are, there is that sense of despair. I really hate the racism. I'm very happy for him to learn from me to help that despair be channeled into a really constructive activity rather than just, you know, bang, smash an egg. I do hold him accountable <laughs> and I will continue to. It's like he's got this second nagging mother. But um, he's young and he's idealistic and he wants to do something to try and make the world a better place. We want to be able to leave these communities with something that has a life beyond just us coming in and doing something and going. We're trying to train up as many local artists as possible. So it's like entry level understanding and training in how trauma affects people. Yeah. One of the first workshops we're kicking off with is a pottery class. So you need to keep your fingers on the outside. And in that class is Fran Giel, who's a world-renowned potter. Hey, Will, not too much water, it'll turn to swamp. <laughs> <laughs> we're really hoping that what this workshop will do is to give her the skills so that when she's conducting her pottery classes, she knows how to deal with people who are traumatised, how to respect your distance, but also to protect herself because she's been through incredible trauma. She had a horrendous time during those fires. OK, I'm regretting this now because it just really looks like a hollow piece of grey poop, what I've made. So um, maybe, maybe I should stick to comedy, you know? That's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. This is all still a work in progress. But what we're finding is that even for the people who aren't taking part in the classes, the impact of us just being there has been enormous. And I will be seeing it through. Everyone thinks of Magda as a star. She's just, she's just human. She's just, just like the rest of us, you know? She just wants to see Australia be Australia. And, you know, 
We'll give a 10 out of 10 for that, you know. Oh. Macca has got um, some of his mates together, fabulous guys, met a couple of them already, and um, we're just going to sit around the campfire and have a chat. Love that. But in the meantime, I can't open my green kale smoothie. I'm going to see if one of them has the threat. I think bloody everyone knows that there's more trauma awaiting us, not less. Oh, what a man. Oh, oh, mate. You know, you can't stop it happening. It's how you deal with it. It is like the sword and the stone. You are the king, my friend. It's grief and loss, and it's that deep, you know, need to connect. Mates around here mean everything to you. And that's why our community is the way it is, I think, why it's so strong. It's that moment when all sort of human pretense just drops away and you're just a couple of people one who's been through something really hard and another who hopes that they can do something to help.